Well, good morning. Well, it's a pleasure for me <clears throat> to open this uh, first panel on the plea for social impact. As it has been said in the previous table, this is a big challenge that uh, universities are facing, but also other institutions. And we are lucky to have here some significant representatives of these institutions. And we warmly thank you for your presence here today, sharing with us your experiences, practical strategies, and giving us some ideas for our own reflection. Uh, so we warmly welcome uh, Harald Hartung, head of the unit Open and Inclusive Societies at the Directorate General for Research and Innovation of the European Commission, Adolfo Moraes, Deputy Minister for Universities and Research at the Basque Government, Rosa Santibáñez, Vice Rector for Research and Knowledge Transfer at the University of Deusto, and finally, uh, Kaisa Inmonen, Director of Policy at the European Patients Forum. As uh, you can see in our, in our agenda, we have a very, very tight timetable. So we have asked our speakers just to point out the main challenges and summarize the, their ideas. So we know that this is a challenge itself. And well, in, we will give them uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes maximum. But we expect to have an open dialogue with them at the end of the morning before, before lunch. So due to this uh, time, tight timetable, we are not going to interrupt the session, the session for coffee break, but uh, you can take a coffee that is just next to the door and come into, come into the room. And just uh, another quick um, organizational remark, that is that today we have regular academic activity at university. So due to this reason, some of us have to give lectures today and will be uh, coming out and coming in, in the session and we apologize for, for that. And now uh, it's a pleasure to give the floor to the first speaker, um, Harald Hantun, that is going to deal with the topic accountability of research funding at European level. You have the floor, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Chair. And I'm particularly pleased Laura, that you are the moderator here, because in my previous life in the, at the European Commission, I've been in charge of the Jean Monnet chairs, and to have a Jean Monnet professor here at the mm -hmm. university and to be the moderator is something I really appreciate very much. So thank you for that. Um, what I'd like to do in my presentation, and I have to admit that I will have to shorten it a bit after what you've said. <laughs> um, I would like to take you on a journey uh, where I would like to set out the architecture of the new program, the structure of it, the things which remain stable as compared to the current program and the previous programs, to point to the novelties, um, to see together with you what is the future role of social sciences and humanities in this program, and where do we stand with the assessment of social impact and what are the next steps. Well, as a good official, it's always good to have at the beginning a quote of the commissioner. And I think it's good reason to have this quote because we, are, we proudly present to you a proposal for a new program which is in the range of almost 100 billion euro. I have in the introductory remarks already set out uh, the challenges we have with our budgets, and I think this is remarkable, because if we will be in the future 27 EU member states, it would mean practically an increase by 50% for research and innovation. Now, to have money is good, but what would even be better is to know what you use it for. And there, there are three areas I would like to point out to you, to strengthen the EU scientific and technological base, to boost Europe's innovation capacity, competitiveness and jobs, and to deliver on the citizens' priorities and to sustain our socio-economic model and values. And I think we should not, in particular as far as SSH is concerned, forget about the last point I've mentioned there. Here on this slide, you see 
the position of Europe in research and development in the world. Well, there are good news and there are news where we could improve. Um, we've got 7% of the world's population and I think even if you are not a specialist in demographics, you will see that this will go further down. Uh, however, we account for 20% of global research and development results and we account for one third of the high quality publications. However, uh, the investment we do in research and development is not at the level of our competitors. And our big challenge is that the closer we get to the market, the less competitive we are. And as far as the impact, the social impact of our research is, con is concerned, sometimes it can be improved. Uh, the typical picture you see there is we've got excellent research results, they might be quoted, and then they end up in a drawer. And uh, so we invest and others ripe the benefits of what we have been doing. I know that I'm now very simplistic with what I do, but, but sometimes it sets the scene. Now, uh, as far as the new program is concerned, without going too much into all the details, um, let me first say what you might already know. We've got a program with three pillars that might sound familiar to you. Well, the names and the order of the pillars has changed a little bit, but we deal with open science, we deal with global challenges, and we deal with open uh, uh, innovation. And then on the bottom of it, you've got a fourth part, which is strengthening European research area. And in our internal jargon, we call it in French, le pilier couché. Um, let's have a short look at the different elements of this program. And I do this because in each of these areas, there is an increasing room for social sciences and humanities. And therefore, I would like to mention them to you. Uh, in the first pillar, you will see that we've got the European Research Council which is, I think, familiar to most of you. There we've got bottom-up research and fundamental research. Um, although it's not that well known, but please bear in mind that between 20 and 25% of the current budget of this research counts to go into research on social sciences and humanities. We've got the Marie slodowska curie actions, and we've got research infrastructures. Now, as far as research infrastructures, one might always think about laboratories, about CERN, about all these things. But with big data, which we increasingly need to use in social sciences, these research infrastructures also become more and more important for our field. Now, the second pillar are global challenges. Um, you might recall that now we deal with social challenges and uh, we have now found out that they are not only limited to Europe, but they are global challenges. And there we are aligned with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, we have reduced the number of challenges, uh, not that there are fewer, but uh, we put them together uh, 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 in order to foster cooperation across sectors. I will then later on get back to this and we can then later on uh, discuss uh, further on this. Um, but what we have not tried is simply to assemble a few things and put a new heading, but after the consultation with our stakeholders to see what is the most useful combination. And here you see the different clusters we have got. This is how we call them now, plus the budget uh, we use for this. And the third pillar is an improved role of the European Innovation Council um, uh, 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 because there we need to steer uh, uh, in particular the phase after the basic research how to get to the market. We've got European innovation ecosystems and we've got the European Institute of Technology. And as well, in the European Institute of Technology, there is an important factor of education and training and an important factor for 
social sciences and humanities. I've mentioned that the second pillar of our program deals with global challenges. Now, uh, and now I move on from what we know or what is already familiar to us to the new elements of the program. We will considerably reinforce international cooperation because I think that is only logical um, if you want to deal with global challenges, you also need to cooperate at an international level. Uh, the second element there are missions. And these missions are a bit, in the current discussions, everybody mentions them. Nobody knows exactly what it is. Um, but let me try to set out uh, uh, what it is. And I always have to look at my own notes. Well. It's a portfolio of actions to achieve bold and measurable goals within a set time frame. And with this, we want to achieve an impact which goes beyond the individual actions we have. So let me give you two examples. Uh, Plastic-free ocean would be one. And we are now debating about the different areas of missions. And there, uh, one theme has come up. We discuss it's not decided yet, but which could be tackling inequalities through education. And for this, you would need different research areas. You would have, you would need uh, uh, education. You would need employment. You would need people dealing with social uh, 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 services and with taxation. So by this, it could really be uh, uh, something quite demanding. So we will see how this will go. Now, um, uh, this is what it is about as far as missions is concerned. Now, where do we stand with missions? Um, they are mentioned in the specific program and in the framework regulation, and the criteria are mentioned. The missions themselves are not yet mentioned. And the Commission did not do this for the very simple reason that we don't know now what might be a, an additional challenge in five to seven years. So therefore, we would like to be rather open. On the other hand, we have full understanding that the member states and parliament want to know what will happen with their money. So we will find a way that both, which will satisfy uh, the two sides uh, uh, involved into this. And the third element related to the novelties in the new program. This is impact. I've mentioned that we have uh, uh, additional money. We're accountable for what we do, and we need to explain what we do with this. Now, in order to measure the social impact, we need to have a closer look at social sciences and humanities and what their place is in the new program. Mm -hmm. Now, we've got three levels there. We've got an integration approach, that is to say, and you might be aware that every year we publish a report on the integration of social sciences in uh, 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 the pillar of uh, 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 societal challenges um, to see how much they are involved. I must say that we have a report we report on these things, but we need to further improve it. And this is what we do with our stakeholders in order to see how these things work. Uh, what we would like to do now is to broaden this overview to see what happens in the research, in the European Research Council and also in other areas of the program. Secondly, we've got one specific global challenge which deals mainly with social sciences, namely the one on inclusive and secure society. Um, the first thing which might come to your mind, well, why do you combine inclusive and uh, uh, secure society? The idea behind is that one does not go with the other. You need to have a well-functioning democracy, an inclusive society to build security, and on the other hand, you need to have security in order to develop an inclusive society. And the third element we work on is a bottom-up, namely uh, SSH research in the ERC and the other elements. Now, 
here you see the elements uh, which are included, uh, the so-called intervention areas in the Euro jargon um, uh, of this cluster number two. So why did we go for this? Just to give you some facts and figures. The Freedom in the World Report 2018 states that democracy faces the most serious crisis in decades and there is a decline in democratic standards and a decline in the levels of trust to political institutions. Um, automation impact. 14% of the OECD jobs are highly automatable, meaning that 66 million jobs risk to either change dramatically or to disappear. Although GDP is still on the rise, um, the, inequalities increase, uh, the inequalities increase. And last but not least, we've got the largest number of arrival of refugees since the Second World War. And we need to deal with these things, and that is the reason why we've got these intervention areas. I will not go individually through them. We can do this later on. Um, now that we've seen where the place of social sciences and humanities is, uh, let's go into the question of the impact and where we stay there. Now, how do we deal with that? Um, we have started with this work, uh, I would say, yeah, towards uh, 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 just before the summer break. We base our work on experience from previous framework programs, on our internal working groups, and they are working quite busily, on studies, literature, review, because there is a lot going on in the different member states, and on external expertise. And that is also the reason why I'm here, so that I can listen to you and take your messages with me to Brussels and see how we can then make uh, out of this uh, 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 a new meaningful way of reporting on impact. Now, I will not go through all the details of uh, the different lessons we have learned, but what we want to do now is to make a shift from collection of input data and management data, which we would still do, to see more what is the output, and not output only at project level, but output at uh, 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 program level. We design, and you will hear this very often now, uh, 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 impact pathways, and try, although we need to collect additional data, try to reduce the burden considerably for our beneficiaries because we're working now on ICT solutions where we can collect data which already exists. Um, as far as the impacts are concerned, well, we deal with three different types of impact, scientific impact, societal impact, and economic impact. As far as scientific impact is concerned, I think we're quite well advanced. And you can also see this with the key uh, 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 priority indicators uh, of the current program. As far as economic impact is concerned, our methodologies are quite well defined. And as far as so, uh, societal impact is concerned, I would say that we're still at the beginning because it's a very complex area. Now, we have constructed the where pathways to these things. I will not go into the details now because I think we will have time to do this uh, 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 during the next two days. But we've got, for the three different kinds of impacts, we've all in all got nine different pathways. And I just take the ones on, the social, uh, on, 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 on social impact. Please bear in mind that in addition to the pathways, we need also to divide it up into the time horizons. Short one is for one year when the first projects are completed. Medium would be after three years, so we would have an idea for a midterm evaluation, and after five years it would be an ex post evaluation of the program. Yeah, here I now, it's just, we don't go into the details, but these are now uh, the different ways these pathways are designed. And I just take uh, 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 the last one here. No, that was this one here. Yeah, here on the different 
uh, 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 emissions, you can see division by the time and what the deliverables should be. And what we, what we should do in our discussions is then to, to have a look at this framework in what way we can deal with this when we first specify what we would like to do. Now, what is it that we have learned and what should we do in the future? And this is already the end of the presentation um, I will do. Um, we need to have a more sophisticated approach. We can't only split into details and not link them together. Um, we also have the intention to have key indicators in the legal basis. Um, we will have indicators at program level. And we need to distinguish between the performance short, medium, and long term. <laughs> Oops, sorry. <laughs> You're okay? <laughs> now, from a common sense point of view, from what I've uh, uh, collected so far, in our work we need to deal with four, no, with five elements. Quantitative ones, qualitative ones, with the methodology, with the accountability, and with causality. Now, as far as the quantitative ones are concerned, um, we need not to forget our holistic approach. With whatever indicator we develop, we need to see into what respect it really contributes to measuring what the goal is and if we have achieved it. First point. Second point, we need to meaningfully combine individual indicators in order to get a much better view of what that means and what is the outcome. And they need to, need to be meaningful, transparent, feasible, and concrete. As far as quality is concerned, whatever the methodology will be, we will design. We need to have a narrative part in it. We need to explain what that is about so that people can grasp it because then we will have a good acceptance of this. Accountability, we need with our indicators to really see can we determine what our influence has been in order to change things. And I think this is one of the very, very um, uh, 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 big challenges. And um, uh, as far as the quantity is concerned, I think we're quite advanced. As far as the quality assessment is concerned, we're still at the beginning. Um, on the methodology, I think we will have time to discuss this um, uh, 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 in the course of today and tomorrow. And to, to end with, let me give you some food for thought. And this comes from uh, Helga Novotny, who used to be uh, 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 the president of the ERC and uh, who's worked together with colleagues, and she will also be one of the leading persons at the conference in Vienna. Um, and I've taken uh, a, a reduced quote. We need to rethink the transformative relationship between science and society. Scientific research is about transformation, how to enable it or how to avoid it. It is about transformation that society is undergoing as much as about transformative power uh, 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 inherent in knowledge and policies based on science knowledge. The social sciences and humanities are deeply involved in this process that use scientific and scholarly approaches to bring about a better society, as difficult as this might Arguably, their societal and political relevance has always been more present in the political arena than that of natural sciences. This should be acknowledged and not denied, and what we now need to do is to really bridge these two worlds. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harald. It has been very interesting. Thank you for all your suggestions, the interesting food for thought. It's been really <laughs> well. And now um, it's a pleasure to give the floor to Adolfo Moraes, that is going to deal with the topic accountability and connection of research 
with regional development in the Basque University Plan 2019-2022. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, let me start by saying that I have uh, prepared a few words. Uh, mm, and when I, when I try to order my ideas uh, about social impact and the regional development and how we deal with this uh, issue in the, in the Basque country, I found, I found that the information is not really gathered in a way that we can, uh, we can give a speech on the approach for social impact uh, across uh, the government in all the different departments. Um, so th that is going to be a difficult task to order these ideas today for you. But I, I, in any way, I think the issue was uh, uh, very enriching for me uh, in the sense that I had to uh, collect and gather uh, information. Uh, and I, I don't know if I'm going to be uh, what do you expect uh, on the on the on the speech. But anyway, I have 10 minutes to talk to you about the Basque Country and the way we uh, approach research and the way we approach uh, social impact uh, um, with, a, with a stress on the university sector because this is, this is my duty. I'm, uh, my duty is to uh, deal with the universities and do the research mainly related to universities. Um, so, um, why the Basque Country has started to change uh, the policies and to uh, bring new, uh, a new approach to the, to the research policies, specific, specifically at uh, uh, university level? Let's say there are many ingredients for it, but main, the main ingredient, of course, is the uh, recent austerity measures uh, in the wake of the financial crisis. Okay? Uh, this should be linked also to the fragile economic growth uh, that we are experiencing, although we are happy with it after this crisis years, but the, the, the economic growth is very delicate uh, and is not as, uh, as strong as we would like to. And also, uh, I think uh, we should add to it the international uh, political threats, which I'm not going to mention, but I think uh, some of them will be in your minds, anyway. Uh, so this has triggered a shift in the in the policy of the Basque government uh, in uh, many issues, and and today I'm going to talk about the uh, research, and I'm going to talk about the universities, as I said. Um, our prime minister, our Lendakari, uh, has put the government's focus on collaboration, uh, and this is due to this situation. So basically, what we call the Ausolana which means uh, collaboration is nowadays for the government uh, a key uh, factor, a key element for any, for any policy. And uh, I don't say just uh, collaboration as, uh, you know, an empty word. I, I mean it. Uh, so that is uh, in all our uh, new programs, uh, you will uh, undoubtedly see that we have changed from an approach that is mainly uh, independent to the, the department to an approach which is uh, dependent on, on multiple departments. There is another element for us that is very relevant and is the, the, the change, the rapid change in the labor needs and markets. Um, uh, and we are aware that we are going to have a strong um, requirement from the industry, from the employers, uh, to bring uh, talent to the Basque Country and to bring talent from universities which are the main, uh, let's say, factories of talent in, in the Basque Country. So this is, this is another element. But uh, the commitment of the Basque government with research uh, comes from a very long time ago. Uh, uh, the Basque government has a, let's say, I would say, a rich ecosystem of uh, different initiatives related to research in industry and research also at the university uh, level. Um, basically, um, I don't know if uh, um, the approach is the uh, right one nowadays, but uh, th this is what we have. We have uh, an approach for uh, the whole government and the whole, uh, all the administrations, different ones uh, in the Basque country. Uh, to work together 
uh, for um, pushing for research. Okay? And there is an element which is very relevant in our case, and it's that uh, what I call we have a, a peace, a political peace, with respect to the, to the view of the different political parties and the different departments uh, and administrations on the issue of research. So basically, uh, I'm, a, I'm a, in a quite uh, comfortable situation uh, when we talk about uh, finance and resources in the past country because the, the commitment of the Prime Minister, which is the commitment also of the Parliament, uh, uh, um, a unified commitment, by the way, uh, is that um, we should increase our resources, our funding, uh, in a 5% uh, investment, public investment, every year. Okay? So basically, now that we are working on the new budgets, uh, it is a quite easy situation for the different uh, ministries uh, to go with ideas and get funding for it, okay? Limited funding, of course, right. Um, the thing, the issue there is that how uh, can we relate this 5% increase, why 5% and not 7% or even a 20% and how we can relate this increase in the funding to the increase on the impact of uh, these, uh, these funds. And, and this is, the, this is the, the issue for the future, okay? Our current, uh, we, we have many uh, strategic plans. Uh, let's say that the main one would be the Science, Technology and Innovation Plan, uh, which is uh, a smart strategy, uh, okay, which we try in the government to uh, bring all the different agents, universities as well, uh, to um, provide policies which will enrich this smart strategy, okay? But this plan, when it was designed, it was designed so that um, <clears throat> uh, you can read that on the foreword, uh, we focus on the returns, okay? Uh, so we, this plan is not focused on the social impact, and there is a reason for it. And the reason for it is that, uh, if I understood well from uh, the head of unit's speech, uh, it is still there is no uh, real model for all of us uh, to measure the social impact. And uh, which is true, what is true is that we have a model uh, to uh, evaluate and to have the returns, okay? So th this is this is one of the of the relevant things. Mm, what is going on on the uh, Department of Education, on the Vice Ministry of Universities and Research? Okay, we also have a unique uh, experience in terms of uh, financing our university system, and uh, the, the main finance goes for research, of course. And this, this is because we started in 2005 with a, a set of uh, university plans which basically uh, mm, uh, they have an agreement with the different universities in the Basque Country so that we finance different activities. That was the first plan. So we were financing activities proposed by the universities. Uh, um, and these plans have evolved from a, what I call university action structure to what we would like to be the next plan in 2019, next year. We are working on it as the rector uh, well knows and Rosa as well. So this plan, uh, we try to base it on a university system and on an impact system, okay? I, to be honest with you, I don't expect the plan to be uh, a real uh, proposal for measuring social impact because we still have many doubts about how to measure it, okay? But we are much working on the different indicators, uh, a short list of indicators that we believe will measure uh, somehow the impact of the universities in many of the issues that, as at the beginning I, I said, 
are very relevant to us nowadays. So employment, uh, relationship with the different agents, with the society, um, um, uh, excellence research, um, um, innovation in, uh, uh, in the lecturing at university level, etc. Um, okay, um, that means A, we have been going through a very uh, deep and difficult process also with the universities to agree on a list, short list of indicators, which is, uh, let's say, uh, I think a very good starting point for it, okay? Uh, and B, uh, I cannot uh, describe today the basics of the plan in detail because it is a draft and we are working on it. Okay? But basically the main idea is that we go to a system idea and we go to an impact idea. Somehow we are going to start measuring impact, social impact of our investments. Uh, the second idea is that, uh, okay, so there you have the indicators apart which are working, uh, as I said, we are working on. Uh, the second part is that we are also working on uh, how to link the um, strategic planning of the government and the strategic planning of the universities, okay? So the system approach is how to uh, enrich our proposals with the, with the autonomy with the, and the, with the knowledge that universities have of their own, uh, you know, details and how to bring together a plan that basically um, will have a connection between the ideas that the government would like to push and the ideas that the universities would like to push. And you know, in this intersection is where uh, I can see more um, interest uh, from the universities and from the government because usually these inter intersections are very much related to the impact of their work for the society, okay? Um, Okay, so let's say that we have many issues. Um, so more than just um, telling you, I'm going to ask you for uh, ideas. Uh, we have many issues to tackle for uh, this coming uh, university plan. Excellence versus or uh, in collaboration with impact. Teaching, uh, lecturing at university and research related lecturing at university, which is not all. Okay, uh, from our point of view, university autonomy and real collaboration of the university with the administration and with uh, the society, and um, going from a once vision to a system uh, to a system vision. Okay, uh, just to put into uh, some some numbers, uh, which are sometimes are good after a few uh, minutes talking. Let's say that the um, Science, Technology and Innovation Plan had a, a horizon of an investment of 11.3 billion euros in the Basque country. That, uh, that is an investment from the administration and from the industry, mainly from industry. Uh, what is failing is not the part of, of the administration. What is failing on this horizon of 11.3 billion euros is the investment of the industry. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the other number would be uh, that in the past country, in the past region, as I mentioned right at the beginning, we are increasing our funding. We are, right now, the funding would be 1.9% of the GDP uh, in the past region. Uh, it used to be a little bit better, but it's true that this is very much related you know, to the uh, internal income. Okay, so this one is growing. And although the uh, administration investment is growing, you know, the industry investment is not so much, okay? So we have a drop in that percentage, although our effort is bigger, okay? Uh, the other numbers would be, um, we hope in the next plan that university will be, uh, the universities will be 0.4% uh, of that, uh, of that income. So we are aiming at, uh, nowadays it's around, 0.32, okay? So we are aiming at uh, that the expenditure in research uh, coming from the university sector will increase and will get up to 0.4%, which is uh, 
a difficult task anyway. Um, that cannot be done as it happens in the case of the uh, you know, science, technology and innovation uh, plan. That cannot be a reality if we just consider the resources coming from the public administration. So therefore, uh, we should see a shift in the, in, the, in the approach of the universities also uh, to bring resources from different sources, not just from the public sector. Okay? So we are, in a way, uh, proposing that universities should have a stronger link to the society. They should have a stronger link to the industry. Okay? And this, is, this has already started at a um, lecturing level. Uh, a year ago, the prime minister presented the um, strategy for uh, university business. Okay? And, uh, and um, I, I say that I am guilty of calling it university business. Uh, at that time, I, I thought that it was not right to call it university society. But we wanted to focus on the business part. Okay? So basically, now universities, in just one year, they have gone from a, uh, an a scenario where they were working with uh, different agents. They were not so much collaborating among themselves. We have created a cluster of uh, faculties of science and technology. Uh, we have created the first uh, room lab for business university. So we, what we are doing is we are feeding this system approach so that they work together and they also collaborate with the different um, agents in the uh, research ecosystem related more to industry. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so aligning risk uh, three, aligning the uh, smart strategy and aligning the university uh, research is one of the main objectives, okay? How can they uh, provide to this uh, smart strategy in the future in a higher level, okay? Um, <clears throat> and the other, the other part that which is very relevant, uh, in my view, uh, and that we expect from the, also from the universities, is uh, we also need to uh, have a policy for the outreach of the uh, results, the outcomes of the research, okay? So we have also produced a new STEAM uh, Euskadi strategy uh, aiming at the society so that the universities and the industry as well is more uh, related to uh, the teaching in uh, previous levels, educational levels, okay? Okay, so we have quite a, a comprehensive um, approach to collaboration with society. And what I, I think I could give you a lot of examples of how we have um, oriented our, our for example, uh, project funding programs so that they have a better link to this smart strategy which we link to the uh, social impact, although I, I am aware that this is not necessarily the only aim for, for the future. Okay, shortly, uh, just, just to um, end up, uh, I know that the, the title of the, of the 10 minutes talk, I don't know if I was too long, but the, the title was accountability, which is uh, as the head of unit told to us before. It's very much linked to this approach of uh, getting to the right uh, short list of indicators, uh, the, the model, and, and really changing the policy from uh, you know, a, a re a returns to an impact uh, policy. This is the way we see that. To um, uh, how to connect, which was the second part of the, of the, of the title, how to connect universities with uh, regional uh, development. And this is, this is the aim of the, of the forthcoming 2019-2022 uh, uh, university system plan, okay? Up to now it was university plan, and now it will be called university system plan. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much for sharing with us these uh, vast government reflections and also the, those aspects you are working on and this, at this time, and also for your call for collaboration to universities that we are well. Uh, and now I would give the, um, the floor to Rosa Santibáñez. She's going to deal with the um, question on how to include social impact in a university research strategy within systems in transition or under definition. So, so. Thanks, Laura, and thanks, Harald and Adolfo, for your words, inspiring words and, and your speeches. I'm afraid I am going to repeat some ideas <laughs> they have <laughs> presented and defended. Sorry but uh, although I know we don't have a lot of time available, uh, I would like to repeat them just to remind us that we agree in many uh, ideas and in many things, okay? So um, I have prepared a very simple presentation with the key messages I, to let you follow me, okay, in my speech. So sin, since my presentation is framed in this first session, I would like to share with you four ideas, three or four ideas, depending on the time available, around our interpretation of the process we are immersed in. And finally, to put forward some proposals and challenges to be faced by all actors involved. So let me start with the first idea. These are the structure of the or table of contents of my speech. So four ideas, key ideas, key messages, and I would like to reach the last one, which is identifying some challenges to be faced. Okay, the first idea defends that the terms impact and social impact have been embedded into our collective imaginary, at least within the scientific and academic world. But they are distinct terms and do not have a shared meaning. Just an example. When we type into Google the term social impact or societal impact, we receive more than 10 million results. In this globalized world, many people and many institutions use the term. However, the uses and meanings vary broadly. The European Commission and other international institutions, research departments of ministries and universities have focused their attention on it. And besides this phenomenon, we observe a clear increment of professionals and services devoted to this topic. When we talk about impact, we are referring mainly to scientific impact. And the publications of research results in ranked journals, such as, for example, Web of Science, CIMAGO Journal Ranking, and so on. In the academic world, the social impact appears to be recognized as an emerging concept with different terms like social impact, social innovation, or knowledge transfer. I am summarizing, okay, just to fit with the time. With this idea in mind, how do we perceive the social impact in our context or in our setting? There is an increasing interest, motivation, and commitment, both at international and more proximal context. How could this idea be proven? I would like to illustrate this with a couple of cases at national and regional level. I'll introduce the third, or I go to the third uh, case directly, just to follow the time, okay? But I had in mind, for example, uh, analyzing, uh, we can prove this trend, analyzing some competitive calls, or we can also prove through some reports on it or on closer terms, such, for example, the latest Cotex report. But I go to the third case, which for me is uh, the more relevant or significant. The Council of Rectors of a Spanish University, what we call La Crue, has commissioned to Salustiano Mato, formerly rector 
of Vigo University with a complex and innovative task of measuring, measuring uh, transference and social impact. Mato uses three inspiring words to title his work. Acknowledge, promotion, and reward. According to this expert, society should be aware of the university's objectives, teaching, research, and knowledge transfer. His proposal of measurement includes three large areas. The first, human capital, the second, the market, and the third area, the most emergent and less developed, called social projection. What can we say related to our closer context? A few examples of our local and Basque setting. Of course, Adolfo has introduced all this, uh, the, the debate and the situation of this uh, debate in, in, Basque, uh, in Basque country. In 2016, a joint statement of commitment to social impact was signed by the Basque government, the Basque Business Confederation, what we call Confebasque, and the University of Deusto. So that is a, a point in, in, in our history, starting with we, are, we were focusing on social impact. Nowadays, the Basque, new Basque University system plan, which is almost finalized, sets out the roadmap for the next three years and includes around 50 indicators to measure the impact of research and how we have to give this return or to demonstrate with evidence that we are aiming and reaching the objectives we proposed. It uses the smart specialization strategy as Adolfo has uh, presented as a way of bridging the world of research closer to the priorities and needs of the regional development. Amongst the indicators, we can find some focus on the concept closer, closest to transfer, but it also introduces collaborative research with other relevant stakeholders. Third idea. This overview almost automatically lead us to raise the question are we talking about two words or two cal cultures that cannot be reconciled? Scientific impact has relevance for the academic, scientific, and research worlds. Moreover, it is mainly evaluated through the quality of publications. It is not, however, free from polemics. For example, Reinhard Werner, professor of theoretical physics at the Leibniz University of Hanover, in 2015, wrote an article in Nature entitled The Focus on Bibliometrics Makes Papers Less Useful. With this, he defends significantly diverging and disruptive ideas from the present trend. Could it be that by measuring the impact through rankings and citations, we are only measuring one aspect of impact? As for social impact, it demands social usefulness and social value from the research. What is reached implies a change in professional practices, in public policy, and to some extent, in people's lives. We can illustrate this idea with a, a very simple example. It would not occur to anyone that the discovery of a new vaccine should have as its last task the publication in a high impact review. But it should, of necessity, reach those who make decisions on health policy, those professionals who use or may prescribe or supply such vaccines, and of course, the citizens as well. We are considering more and more the relevance of social impact, but we share neither the term nor a common meaning. Besides this, some authors are stressing the idea that if we do not have a shared meaning of social impact, it would be more difficult to measure it, which is logical. And all of, all of us know that what it, it is not measured do not exist. 
In this line, Peter Flynn, today with us in this workshop, and Chris Barnett warn us a new phenomenon they call the paradox of social impact that he will go through later on. Hope. <laughs> I hope that. Four idea. Social impact seems to be recognized as a key element for inclusion in research strategy. At the latest meeting of the Network for Advancing and Evaluating in, of the Societal Impact of, uh, of Science, held in Ottawa last June, some interesting ideas were advocated. For example, David Sweeney defended and justified the need for us to focus on social impact. Mona Nemer proposed that science and politics are two different cultures that are called upon to collaborate. Yuko Arayama, the pleasure of whose company we have as a contributor to this workshop, gave an inspirational presentation on social impact as a key element of future societies in transition from what he, she called a society 4.0 to a society 5.0. And last but not least, Crystal Trimley supported the idea that thinking about social impact implies not only sharing the results of research with more stakeholders, with of course, but also prior to this, sharing the process by including the community and encouraging its participation. This reminds me of the idea presented by Harald, speaking about that the process should be bottom up. Okay? So involving the community and the citizens. The fifth idea is more a list of challenges and proposals that come as a result of for, for, for our former statements. First, in my view, it is necessary to define or search for a more inclusive concept of social impact. And going a little bit beyond that, we need to focus on different tools to measure social impact. We can do <coughs> some proposals even among bibliometric, such as Almetrics. And we have to assume that, uh, as you defend also, the impact is difficult to measure and requires a different timeline. This does not mean, however, that we should not do it, but that we should be cautious about the conclusions we draw. Second. We need to change our, our culture, and I would say a little bit more, we should change our minds and the way, not only the way we think, but also the way we act and behave. We need to change our, cal our, our culture. In our opinion, the point is not a matter of choosing between scientific impact and social impact. Both are required, both are likely to represent the extremes of a continuum in which we move. Maybe we have to introduce in this continuum the economic impact, the third element. <laughs> uh, this may imply that researchers may be located in different places of that continuum. Sometimes scientists will strive to reach out to society, policy makers, practitioners, and citizens. And other times, researchers must be geared towards publishing what they discover in better value journals sowing and disseminating the usefulness of what we do stands as a responsibility and an ethical commitment. And last but not least, we have to move, to move forward by tackling the following steps. Some actions, implications of this proposition are the following. Having a theory of change and working by hypothesis. Thinking about results, focus, demonstrate with evidence, and trying to measure these results. Collaborating and co-creating among all agents involved at different levels and in each phase of the research process. Working in interdisciplinary teams with other sectors. And finally, communicating and sharing results with others in all potential directions to policymakers and to practitioners and citizens. That's all. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Rosa, for your interesting reflection and suggestion of challenges. And now, um, to end this panel, we are giving the floor to Kaisa Immonen, that is going to, to talk on the need for relevant research to address real problems. Thank you and good morning everyone. So my name is Kaisa and I represent the European Patients Forum, um, it, which I will introduce you briefly in a second. Um, I'm also a patient representative in my personal capacity with the BMJ uh, on their patient advisory panel and I'm also the patient co-chair of a working group with patients and consumer organizations at the European Medicines Agency. But those are not the hats I'm, I'm wearing today. So the European Patients Forum, just for those who've never heard of us, uh, we are the only cross-disease um, chronic patients um, organization at European level. So basically we gather under our umbrella other disease-specific and national patient organizations. We are not a research organization, we are um, an advocacy, policy advocacy organization particularly on European health policy, and we also participate in other European-funded projects and collaborative initiatives with uh, not only policy stakeholders, but other types of stakeholders as well. And basically our aim is to bring the patient's perspective into everything that happens at European level, whether it's a regulation, whether it's new legislation or other initiatives. You can see our strategic goals here, and I'm not going to go through them, but we have a very extensive strategic plan, which you can look at online if you want to see more about our work. And why am I here? I'm, I'm assuming it, I'm here because healthcare is facing many challenges, and a lot of that relates to the proliferation and increase on, in chronic diseases and to the need to have different health care um, because people with chronic diseases need long-term care, they need integrated, well-coordinated care and a holistic personal care approach. Um, more and more people are having more than one chronic condition that they live with. This is an increasing trend. Uh, and so I, I guess the job of researchers is to find new solutions for these um, problems and that's not only for treatments but for better models of care for better supporting people in their self-care and self-management as well as, I mean, that includes lifestyles as well, and of course the effectiveness and efficiency of our healthcare systems. Why does the patient perspective matter then? Well, in a way this is nothing new. It has always been somehow recognized. Already the Alma-Ata Declaration in 1978 said that the, it is both the right and the duty of the people to participate in the healthcare systems. What I want to say is that we are very aware of the, the fact that it's something that is new, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily better. And what, what, what we look for as patients is something new, which also brings something that is a concrete benefit for us, that improves people's lives over what we already have. And that's what we would call innovation. And there are challenges here because sometimes, um, or even often, the priorities of what patients feel they need are different from the priorities of researchers, of commercial companies, even of regulators. And I don't think we have <clears throat> yet a common understood concept of what is valuable innovation. Somehow, the, the, now with the, the increased urgency and the pressures on the health budgets, um, there is even more of a, of a need to find that value, I think, and to make sure that, that what, is, um, in, what is invested in is actually working and is, is good and useful. And I think there's also a need to bridge some, uh, some silos, um, some organizational silos and also some financial silos in the health system to have a more collaborative approach, but to also to find the, the, the value across the life um, continuum of a person's life something that is invested in within the health budget may manifest some, some real value somewhere else in the system, in, in social welfare, for example, or in employment. And fundamentally, we need a, a different culture of research, I think, and I'll come back to in a minute. Why do we need to make research better? Well, perhaps some of you have seen um, articles recently that claim that a great majority, up to 85% of medical research, may be wasteful. 
Now, I, I don't know, if, even if we take that with a spoonful of salt and say that maybe in reality it's half of that, that's still a great deal of research that is, is not useful. And there are various reasons for that. One of the reasons is that it's not patient-driven enough. Too much research, and I'm, here it says trials because we obviously as a patient group look at, mostly at um, clinical trials, but let's think about other research too. Too much research is focusing on questions or or outcomes that are not actually the priority of patients because they are driven by different interests. Often those are commercial interests. They could also be academic interests. And the graph here is actually from the James Lind Alliance from the UK, which is a priority setting partnership between clinicians and patients. And you can see that um, the uh, column on the left shows what the patients and clinicians' priorities were. I think this comes from um, uh, from um, rheumatic arthritis, but I, I'm not totally sure about that anymore. But you can see that the stark difference, the column on the right is what was currently then being addressed in commercially driven trials, which focused almost exclusively on drugs, whereas the patients and, uh, really wanted to see non-pharmaceutical um, treatment approaches. In the middle, those are non-commercial trials. Still, you see that drugs are a little bit more prevalent there, but the balance is a little bit better. So what we need to bridge is these priorities, and um, actually the unmet needs are the, the very reason why patient groups want to get involved in research. <coughs> Here is another small illustration. Again, this is a US example, and it comes from comparative effectiveness research in mental health. Um, this study looked at the ongoing research that they, they found that um, fewer than half of the studies they they um, analyzed, included patient-centered outcomes. Uh, less than 20% addressed patients' priorities, and none of the studies they analyzed included patients as partners in the study design. Clearly, there's something wrong with that picture. I'm not saying that's the only picture. There are also lots of good examples. Increasingly, in EU-funded studies, we see that patient, patient groups are included, and my organization and our members are often <coughs> partnering in research but there's still a lot of work that could be done. Why we want this? Well, I'm not going to give you case studies of um, what added value patient involvement brings, because you as academics can find the literature easily, <clears throat> um, which is, by the way, not so easy for us non-governmental uh, organizations. We often don't have access to academic journals that are behind paywalls, but that's a, a small bracket. What I want to stress is that <clears throat> It brings better alignment with um, the, the real needs that exist in society and the priorities of research. When you have maybe less to invest, you want to invest more carefully, you want to invest in the right things. It's also shown that patients' um, involvement in clinical research uh, makes for a better study design and actually reduces the costs of that research because there will be uh, more recruitment, uh, more participation, fewer dropouts, so patients will stick the course because the study is better designed. And the truth of the matter is that we bring a different reality to the table. We just bring a different perspective, and sometimes that means challenging the researchers' um, prior assumptions. And I do want to stress the importance of the, the fact that patients are champions of research. And I think now, more than ever, the research community needs our support we can help you foster public understanding of science and of research and um, trust in science. I mean, this is um, so clear for us. We're, we're working on an initiative on vaccination right now to try and counter some of the, the misinformation that is out there and to try and engage patient organizations um, as champions of vaccination and immunization. Um, we see that there are different types and degrees of involvement. I'm sure you all know the Arnstein Ladder of citizen involvement from back from 1969. That's been variously um, adapted by, by different projects. And what I show you here on the right is, is a patient uh, partnering in research project that was uh, funded by the EU, incidentally, back in 2010. And there we see that um, we want to go up the ladder at the lowest level, we're just research subjects, and actually um, we don't even in EPF talk about subjects anymore. We find that very patronizing. We talk about participants now. Um, 
you can be an information provider. You give your data, maybe you give some other information. You can be an advisor, but then what we really want to see is those upper limit um, levels where actually patients are co-researchers and sometimes the driving force of research. Many patient groups, especially in rare diseases, now actually fund their own research. When they don't, they don't uh, see anyone else doing it, they do it. Um, what I want to say is that we as, as patient organizations advocate meaningful patient involvement. What does that mean? Well, we do have a concept for that and, and this was developed a few years ago in one of our projects. Basically, it's the opposite of tokenism. It means collaboration and it means partnership. It means that the patient's input is recognized for, for its value, that we are seen as genuine partners. There is a term called experiential expertise or experiential knowledge. That's what we bring to the table. It's a different kind of knowledge and it complements the scientific knowledge. And together, those, that can be much more powerful. It also means that the contribution of patients needs to be recognized and it needs to be compensated. We cannot be treated as volunteers if everyone else gets compensated for their time and, and their expertise. It also means you need to consider it in advance. You need to build it into the design of the study and you need to evaluate its impact, of course. There are numerous challenges here, beyond what I've already said. There are some ethical questions and practical ones. I already mentioned the remuneration question. I've seen uh, or I've heard quite a lot of different views. Some patients say they don't want any compensation. Others feel that they are experts like other experts and they want to be paid. Um, what I would say is that patients are often um, burdened with extra things that researchers don't have to live with. They have the condition they have to deal with. Um, they often work, so they have to work around to participate in research studies. They may also be carers of, of family members. Um, they may have other costs uh, to think of. And I think an important point is that um, the challenge they may bring the, in terms of the professional power and who is allowed to speak and who is allowed to have a, an opinion at, at the, a scientific level. I'm going to talk a little bit about representation and, and uh, capacity building now. So, because this is something I get asked quite a lot. Different objectives may need different types of patient participants and sometimes there is a confusion of what an individual can bring to the table and what a representative of an organization can bring. Basically someone who is just uh, a patient brings their own perspective like I do when I participate as myself in some initiatives. Um, that person had not, not necessarily any support structure behind them. Um, they may not know other patients or, and their views, and they really bring their personal experience. And this can be hugely valuable, and it often is. But sometimes you need someone who represents the group of people and the collective view. This means that they have a mandate from their constituency. If, if I'm a patient organization representative, I give the, uh, the views of our membership, which we have, uh, we have a process to gather those views and put them into, into our work. Uh, we have a consultative structure behind us. If I have a question, I can go back to our members and ask. But I think at the end of the day, no one can be fully representative. This is a kind of an illusion, and it's a bit dangerous to think that the patients can only participate if they are representative. The fish here, the, the red fish, is called the red herring. Uh, it's a, a nice English expression for something that is actually a dis distraction from an other, another issue that is more important. Thank you. So then um, you have to manage different interests. Sometimes they may be in conflict with each other. But again, I don't think that uh, this is something that should be made too much of. We at EPF are fully in favor of full transparency um, and conflicts of interest declarations and such. Every expert needs to be treated at, on the same level. Everyone has certain biases and everyone has certain connections. And the more we go towards collaboration, the more we will have experts who work with a range of stakeholders, including commercial ones. So the objective should be always to manage these things, but in a proportionate way, and not to undermine the end result. Just a word about capacity building. Um, it is very important. 
but it should never be seen as a barrier to participation. Don't think that only trained patients can participate in scientific research. It really depends on what you're after. Training can be very helpful, but again, we see it more as something to balance the power and the, the balance to um, level the playing field, so to speak. And a few uh, reflections before I close. This is the, the last but one slide that I have. One thing I would like to maybe ask is whether there is enough recognition for um, the importance of training for those people who want to work with patients. Because that also, I think, requires some, some training and getting used to the process. And the second point I want to pick out is, is patient involvement still conditioned too much on shaping the patient to suit the system, rather than maybe in a more disruptive way on changing the way the system works to, to suit the patient. And finally, um, since we are talking about impact, I think it's hugely important to try and evaluate the impact, but um, these things can be quite difficult to capture in, in traditional metrics. Some patient representatives have said to me that just the fact that they were present in a room changed the way people interact to each other. It changed the conversation. But how do you capture that in an impact uh, metric? It, it can be quite hard, and the simplistic solutions may not achieve actually what you want to achieve. So to conclude, um, yeah, I think it's about doing things right by involving patients, but also that means that you will be doing the right things. Patients' involvement in research is no longer an optional extra. It's really an essential today. And we are seeing a culture change, and I think this is um, it's for everybody to support this culture change. Um, I want to say that I didn't say anything much about the how. The how do you do this then? How do you do patient involvement? And how do you measure its impact? That's because we are starting now a reflection with our different stakeholders on this, preparing for a major conference next year which we are going to have in Brussels in November 2019 on meaningful uh, patient involvement in the health system. And that includes involvement in research. So it would be great if anyone who is interested in, in exploring that topic together um, could come. And, and I'm happy to share some more information with that. What we want to move towards is this graph on the right, where the patient is part of the circle, circle of care. It could be circle of research, no longer the object that other people are just working on. So from research on patients, we want to really move to research with patients and that will be better. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much for this nice uh, perspective from the other side of the social impact. It has been very inspiring. And we thank all the speakers for all your contributions. And now we pass the floor to the second panel. Thank you very much.